Can you imagine writing down an equation and being hated for it? Having colleagues deride your creations and even your work tirelessly to make sure that you can't find a permanent position? Let me tell you about George Cantor a father of six, and a genius. He was a mathematician from the 19th century who gave us set theory and introduced us to the concept of multiple infinities. Cantor first defined countable infinity, which is the infinity you get when you put together all of the counting numbers, like one, two, three, etc. But then he found something weird. He realized that the reals, while infinite, were not countable. And he got there in the most unexpected way. He was just playing with some trigonometry. Well, specifically trigonometric series. And he knew this result was gonna be controversial, so he actually hit it in a publication with an unrelated title. But they were found. And man, did the world of mathematics hate him for it. Now, Cantor was granted a full professorship at the age of 34 at the University of Hale, which is the, an extraordinarily young age. But he wanted to move to a more prestigious university, the University of Berlin, where he actually got his doctorate, but it was blocked by an old professor of his, Kronecker, each and every time he applied. The mathematician Kronecker at the University of Berlin in the 19th century came out and said, I'm not sure if Cantor's work is more philosophy or theology, but it certainly isn't mathematics. It even made it in the history books. He was literally afraid that Cantor was corrupting the youth of mathematics and leading them down this like harried path of corrupted math and et cetera. And, and around that time, lots of other people said that Cantor just ruined the beauty of mathematics. There's no way you don't internalize that. And, and it just gives you such a complex. I mean, Cantor actually had severe depression after all of his papers were published, and as much as he tried to convince people that what he was doing was good, uh, you know, they just didn't buy it. Now, how did Cantor get here from playing with trigonometry? How can we prove a set is uncountable? And why did Cantor say that the set that bears his name it's perfect. In 1822, we saw Joseph Fourier, the scientific advisor to Napoleon Bonaparte, introduce us to Fourier or trigonometric series less than a decade before his death. Fourier essentially gave what he called an analytic theory of heat. Fourier left a lot of questions unanswered, and this drove a lot of mathematics at the time. Fourier claimed that every continuous function could be represented through a trigonometric series. This was later proved by Dirichlet with some added conditions. However, there were other big questions lingering. A big one was the representation itself. Was it unique? Could you possibly have one continuous function that was represented by, say, two completely different trigonometric series that have different coefficients? Or more concisely, if our function was the zero function, are the coefficients we get necessarily zero? A lot of mathematicians tried to resolve this question, including Dirichlet, Riemann, Heine, and others. The answer, as it turns out, is yes. And that was given by Cantor. Cantor realized, and this is what started him down this dark path of set theory, that you didn't need to look at a function at every point. You could remove sets and still get a unique representations in terms of trigonometric series. These sets that you can remove are called uniqueness sets. This is when things started to go off the deep end. People liked that he resolved the uniqueness problem, but then as he added more and more layers to it, they got really uncomfortable. Cantor took the idea of limit points and concocted a derived set which is a collection of all limit points of that set, and so basically we call this, say, P prime for some set P. If P prime is a set of limit points, then that means that P prime prime is a set of limit points of the limit points. If that last set is empty, it turns out that P is a uniqueness set. Then, as mathematicians do, Cantor thought, well, if I can do that twice, can I do it more? Cantor defined a set of the first species as a set where if you consider the nth derived set, then this set is empty. These sets, the first species, are also sets of uniqueness. If you think of derived sets as sort of derivatives, then these sets of first species are kind of the polynomials of set world. Because eventually if you take enough derivatives, it's gonna give you zero, or the empty set. 
At this point, things were getting pretty tricky. Without a good definition of real numbers, he had trouble talking about his results. And this led him to his definition of the reals in terms of Cauchy sequences of real numbers, or equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of real numbers. We have a video on that if you wanna watch it. Which brings us to the topic at hand. If you wanna read more about the seri trigonometric series and his uniqueness results, I have a great reference linked in the description. Cantor started to dive deeper into his abstractions and started to unearth some really unexpected and radical results. He found infinities, like a lot of infinities, and he proved that the natural numbers, which are quote, countably infinite, have a smaller infinity than the real numbers, which we say are uncountable because they don't agree with integers. He knew that these wouldn't be well regarded, and so he hid the result in a paper he titled On a Property of Collections of All Real Algebraic Numbers, which is a much more kosher field to be working in at the time. Now, that argument can be found all over the internet. I'm going to present you with a different proof that uses one of Cantor's concoctions, and this approach is also due to Cantor a couple papers later. He defined a perfect set as a set that was the same as its derived set, and we also require that the set be closed. Okay, so now we're about to dive into actual mathematics here, and I want to thank you for hanging in here this long. If you liked the video, please drop me a like, and also, if you wouldn't mind sharing it with other mathematically inclined people, that would be amazing. Because, you know, I want to grow, and I want to have a bigger audience, I want to help more people. And uh, so, if you can do that, it would help me out a lot. And otherwise, let's get back to it. Now remember, compact sets of the reals are closed and bounded sets. This is the heine borel theorem. Heine was actually a colleague of Cantor's that worked at the same university. Something else we know about compact sets is that if we have a sequence of non-empty compact sets that are nested, then we know that their intersection is non-empty. We can leverage this to prove uncountability of non-empty perfect subsets of the reals or even of Rn. First, remember that a perfect set, P, is a set where every point is a limit point. Uh, we know that if a set has any limit points, then it can't be finite. Hence, non-empty perfect sets are at least infinite. Let's assume that it's not just infinite, but countably infinite, the sort of smallest infinity. Write P as x0, x1, x2, etc. Uh, since countability means we can actually count them all out, that means that we can arrange them in this sequence like this. If that's the case, then we construct a sequence of nested neighborhoods where we can exclude one element at a time. We are going to close up the neighborhoods to get compact sets, since they'll be closed and bounded, and then intersect again with P, which would give a smaller compact set because we have the intersection of two closed sets, and then the closed subset of a compact set is compact. We start with any radius at all, say r greater than zero, and we center a neighborhood at that first point, x naught. Okay, so basically what we've done so far is we took this x naught that is in our set p, and we put a neighborhood around it, and this neighborhood has radius r. When we take the closure of that neighborhood, we get a compact set. So then what we do is we say, okay, well, if x naught is in p, then it's a limit point of p, which means that there is some z in p is not gonna be the same as x naught. So then I can make a neighborhood that doesn't include x naught, but also stays within inside this larger neighborhood. I can have that, and now I have this new neighborhood of v1, where if I take the closure, I get a compact set, and I have v naught closure contains v1 closure. I can make it so that v1 closure doesn't actually include x naught. I take this further down and I find some other element z prime because z is in p and so therefore is the limit point. So there must be some z prime that is not z that is inside of this neighborhood. And so then I make, there's a v2 closure here. It's small enough that it doesn't include x1. Now I haven't written x1 anywhere in here. x1 could have been here, it could have been over here. We just want to make sure that in case it was anywhere near z prime, we make that neighborhood even smaller so that we exclude z x1. You're going to have xn is not going to be inside of vn plus 1 closure. And since we're assuming that p is countable, then we're going to be going through all of the elements of p one at a time. And so then that means that in the intersection of all these vn's closures, n going from 1 to infinity, or 0 to infinity, uh, that basically this intersected with p is empty. Uh, that's just our construction, right? But the thing is, is that each one of these are a compact set. And if we also intersect with p, we know that that's going to contain v1 closure, intersect with p, etc. Each of these are also compact sets because p is assumed to be closed. We have an intersection of a closed set and a compact set, so we end up getting a compact set. 
And so then we have an SS sequence of compact sets, and each of these are not empty because we know at the very least V naught has an, the center is actually in P. These are non empty compact sets that are all nested, and so I know that compactness gets us this Vn intersection of P and the infinite intersection from n equals 0 to infinity of all of this is non empty. So that's a contradiction because that is the same set as this set. And we just said that this was empty because we have eliminated systematically every single element of P one at a time with each one of these Vs. And so then, therefore, uh, P can't be countable because that's a contradiction. So P can't be countably infinite. So it must be uncountably infinite. Okay, so that's nice. Now, we can get that the reals are uncountable if we can just show that there is at least one non-empty perfect subset of the reals. What do perfect sets look like, exactly? Well, first of all, they can't be finite sets, since finite sets have no limit points. In that case, P prime would be the empty set, and that would contradict it being perfect. Okay, okay. so I guess if you have P being empty, then it would be a perfect set, but that, that's just not interesting. So how do we start making a perfect set? Well, we can use the Archimedean property, and we can show that the interval AB is a closed perfect set. Okay, so that, that's actually nice and not too hard. So now we know that intervals are a subset of the reals, so ta-da, we have that the reals are uncountable. How else can perfect sets look? Well, the interval union with an isolated point uh, isn't going to be perfect, because then the isolated point sort of evaporates when you take uh, this sort of derived bit. So maybe non-empty perfect sets are just intervals in. Or maybe a union of intervals, I mean, that would work. Well, no. In fact, Cantor crafted a set that is perfect, but contains no intervals at all. This is the eponymous Cantor set, or the Cantor middle third set, depending on how picky you want to be about this. Let's see how we can construct this set. We start with simply the interval 0 to 1. We start off with the Cantor set by looking at the interval 0 to 1. Take a look at the thirds here. So mark this off as, say, 1 third. We're going to mark this one off as 2 thirds. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to delete that middle third. So our first iteration, we'll call it, say, E1, uh, is going to be composed of the interval from 0 to 1 third and uh, 2 thirds to 1. The Cantor set doesn't stop here. We keep iterating this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the middle thirds of this guy, boop and boop and boop and boop, and we and so now we have uh, 0 to 1 ninth, because that's 1 third of 1 third. And over here, written in terms of ninths, it's going to be 6 ninths. And we end up having, what, 7 ninths, 8 ninths, uh, 9 ninths, or, or 1. And then what we do is we do that again. And so we take off the middle thirds out of each one of these guys. And what we're going to get is this. So we have a whole bunch of 1 27ths. So every time you take a middle third out of each of the surviving intervals, and then you just iterate. So we get from E1 to E2 to E3. And then we go from a length 1 third to a length 1 ninth to a length 1 27th and a 1 81st. And then after that, my powers of three just sort of evaporate. And so that, that's basically how you do it. And so what you do then is you say, okay, well, each of these are closed sets because they're a finite union of closed sets where they're all bounded. And so then that means that they're all compact and they're also nested. So that means that this is a sequence of nested compact sets. And that means that they are not empty. We, we can use that theorem to declare that you know, the Cantor set is not empty. But of course, we can look here and we see that 0 is in, oops, that should be 0. <laughs> uh, 0 is in every single one of these. And so it, we know it's not empty because of that. But actually, any endpoint isn't eliminated. That means that we know that there's even a countable number of points in here. So there's an infinite number of points in our Cantor set. We just know that by inspection. There is at least a countable number of points in the Cantor set. But I'm going to tell you now, it is actually uncountable. So there are many, many more points. The way you show this is to demonstrate that this is a perfect set. And we do that by selecting a point x in the Cantor set. And that means that this point, by definition, must be in at least one interval at every single layer. Well, since the endpoints of the intervals are getting proportionately closer by one third each iteration, we see that we have at least the endpoints of the intervals are going to eventually be in any neighborhood of that point x. Hence, x is the limit point of the Cantor set. And since it was arbitrarily selected, the Cantor set is actually a perfect set. Done. So now we have that the reals are uncountable. And we have some examples of perfect sets. 
I mean, if I was going to have a set named after me, then I'd want it to be perfect too. The Cantor set has all sorts of nice properties, and it also appears in dynamical systems in relation to the tent map. At some point, I'll tell you more about that, but I think we're kind of out of time for now. Thank you so much for sticking in here with me and exploring mathematics and its history. I really do appreciate it. Take care, and I hope you have a nice day.